All right. Good morning. May I have your attention, please? Thank you very much. I would like to officially uh, open this session and welcome you. Thank you for taking time and for your patience for us to get started. Uh, my name is Bernard Shira. Um, I'm the director of Innovate Now, uh, an accelerator program based in Nairobi, Kenya, that supports innovation in the area of assistive technology. And today uh, I will be moderating or chairing this uh, session, which I'm very proud to be surrounded by change makers from all over the world, um, who I will give uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. But this session is about really leveraging on different media um, for advocacy, disability advocacy. So you're going to hear a story about how people are using radio, YouTube, uh, and other digital channels uh, to drive the mission forward. And this is very important for us because when I talk to everybody that I meet and I ask them what are the biggest challenges we have in disability and disability inclusion, awareness always comes top three every time. So how do we create this awareness? So we're going to hear and learn from the best of the best today. So I'm going to introduce them, just give them an opportunity to say their names and which organization they represent, and then we can start. So I will start with Deborah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Deborah Maboya. I am the head of operational programs from Thai Tanzania. Welcome, Deborah. Uh, Pedro. Thank you. Uh, Mike, please. That's right. Yep. That's better. Yes. Okay. My name is Pedro, Pedro Melo. I am from Colombia. Um, we work in North Foundation, BIOS, but Robotic Foundation working with the robot. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Yareli. Hi. Adriana. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yareli Rolander. I am from Mexico. Uh, we work with uh, women and girls with disability. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. And Kwai? Thank you. My name is Kwai Nan. I'm Living Dignity for the Blind from Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And finally, Doran. Uh, thank you. My name is Doran uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, working at Public Fund to Teach Me Competence Development Center. Oh, I did speak. I did skip somebody. Sorry, <laughs> Jeremy. Always overlooked. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Just not. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gaskell. I'm with McLean Association for Children in Georgia, in the country of Georgia, uh, and we work to support persons with disabilities and their families across that country. Very nice to be here. Wonderful. So, so the format we're going to take for this session is I will give each speaker uh, 10 minutes to give us a presentation and a story of their work, and then we will have a Q&A session. Um, so we will we'll go straight into it. And I will start with Deborah from Thai Tanzania. So welcome, tell us your story. Thank you so much. I think I'll stand up now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, good morning once again. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Deborah from Thai Tanzania. And today I'm going to talk about the power of storytelling and technology for social change. So a bit about Thai, what is Thai? So we are a youth-led organization who use the power of storytelling and media technology in form of 3D animation, comic books, and radio drama uh, to create educational content that focus on raising awareness on different challenges young adolescents are encountering in, within our community. Um, five years ago, we saw there was a need to implement a project which will specifically focus on people living with disability. Uh, and our aim is really to create an environment whereby people living with disability, um, they can be able to have an environment which have equal opportunity for them with regardless with their appearance. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want you I want to introduce you to Mira. As you can see, I'm wearing Mira in my T-shirt right now. <laughs> 
Yes, so, and I want you to take a moment to imagine being a girl, ambition girl with dream to be the champion world in basketball. And overnight you wake up, you are in an accident and you can no longer work, walk again. What would you do? The community that I'm coming from, people would expect your dreams to fade up just like that, but not Mira. So today I want to share with you the story of Mira. Mira did not look at disability as inability. She really focused on the dream and the, the goal that she wanted to reach. And the good thing about Mira, she really had the supporting system, like her teacher. And uh, the story that you're going to see about Mira is, a re is, is a inspired by a true story for, from one of the female basketballers in Tanzania. Her name is Lucy. And let me not talk so much. Let's see Mira in the next three minutes. Njai tu si rafiki kwako na unaweza kuumia mwalimu bado naweza kucheza ninaupenda huu mchezo kuliko kitu chochote naomba unipe nafasi in the starting line ladies and gentlemen out of the nation of Tanzania number 34 Mira all the way from the great continent of Africa, the Tanzanian young star is here at the Wheelchair Basketball Paralympics as the best upcoming player in the game. This truly goes to show that anything can seem impossible until it's done. Wow. <laughs> I always I always get goosebumps whenever I watch 
um, Mira's animation. And, and I really encourage each one of you to reach out to Titans and your YouTube channel so that you can be able to see the bigger version of the animation. And you might ask how many people have been, have we been able to impact through this animation. So to date, uh, so far we have been able to reach to 4,000 students through school outreach programs, but also we've been able to utilize traditional social media platform and really be able to engage to 4.5 uh, million people, but also we have been able to disseminate this content through transport buses, which are traveling in different regions across Tanzania. So what is a, su a success for us when we talk about this particular project, Kamoja project? And I think for, for us, a success really to have an environment where people living with disability can be treated with respect and dignity. They can be able to have Access, uh, accessible platforms whereby their voice and concern they can be heard, but also to be able to receive social economical support. Another story, you know, I really love stories. We are all storytellers. So I really, really want you to meet Daniel. So Daniel is a 14 year old boy. He's one of the, our beneficiaries from one of the school outreach programs that we visited. And you can see Daniel is holding a mic. And this is the most important thing when we're implementing our projects. So for him, Daniel, after watching the animation from Mira, it really changed his perspective of life because him being a person who is living with physical disability, he really didn't think that he can be able to accomplish much. But really after seeing this animation, he really got the encouragement and saying, okay, if people have challenges, but it's really, it's all about mentality. What do you think about yourself? What do you think that you can be able to accomplish? And really having the good supporting mechanism, people who can really support you like teachers and people like Ty to really remind you of what you are capable of. So we are really happy for the story of Daniel. And about the sustainability of this project, we're really looking on how we can be able to utilize partnership from different people. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the good thing about Najiamini animation or the stories that we create, uh, they're really in a technological point of view. They can really be used by multiple people. So we are really looking for long-term partners who they can also believe in the idea that Thai we are believing in, and they can be able to take Najiamini animation to the world, and many people can be impacted through it. It. What is next for Thai? I really love this animation. So we have been able to really see the success that we have done through the work that we do. And what we want to do is really to create more impact, reach more people, and really see the Nadia Mini animation mirror reaching to the whole part of the world by creating more content in that aspect. Last but not least, I would really love to uh, Thanks Zero Project for this opportunity. It's a really a great honor as an organization to really be recognized for the great efforts that we have been able to do. I really also want to appreciate and thank each one of you for really selecting this session to come and see and hear about Thai. And to my fellow also uh, speakers who are here, I think it's a really great honor. But also last but not least, I have a lot of people watching on me online from Tanzania, my team, Team Thai. Everything that you have seen, especially in our content, we create in-house. So the animation process, the dissemination process is the team of young people with passion of really impacting their younger generation. So we have a say in Thai Tanzania, and I would really love you guys to support me. We say Team Thai, we fly high. So I'll just say Team Thai, we fly high so that my team can also hear me. Team Thai. We fly high. Thank you. Thank That's you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Wow, thank you so much. That was very powerful and I guess a great start to this session. Uh, we really uh, were all very consumed by that animation. So we're going to go next to uh, Pedro from Boost Robotica, Colombia. Yes, so welcome. Please let me express Oh, sorry. Again, are you using a presentation? Sorry, again. Okay. You can Okay. Uh, please uh, let me express my deep pride and excitement in representing our foundation, the BIOSBOT Robotics Foundation. 
We are more than an organization. We are a home where social inclusion is our compass and robotics is our tool to build a better, more equitable and inclusive future. Today, I want to share with you the essence of our inclusion program and our mission where our heart beats strong in every achievement. It has been five years since we committed with a life project to turn inclusion into a social opportunity through our program, Barriers to Inclusion, a Social Opportunity. Our story begins when my son, Felipe, was only three years old, and at that, and at that time, we received his diagnosis that would change our life, Asperger syndrome. This was a crucial moment in which we embarked on a journey of deep learning about autism, Asperger, and most importantly, about the true essence of inclusion. It was in this process of seeking and growing that we discovered a skill that would completely transform Felipe's world, the fascinating universe of robotics and programming. Developing this skill without a doubt became the best decision we made in our life. We saw how his world went from being a, an environment where he was ignored with a low frustration threshold to becoming a boy admired by his peers, dynamic, willing to interact socially, to speak in public, to work in teams, and to face new challenges, such as participating in robotics tournaments. We, uh, as parents of a boy with Asperger, were faced with a society in which everyone rejects these people and isolates them. We face fear, loneliness, frustration, hopelessness, but we never gave up. Thanks to science and technology, we bring a future for our son and a future we wanted to share with other parents, with other families who, like us, do not see a way forward. That is where the Bible Robotics Foundation was born. We want to share this life experience with many, 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 many more children to give them the opportunity to discover the potential for science, robotics, and programming. In essence, we address three fundamental target groups, children and young people diagnosed with Asperger, those who face the challenge of autism, and those who has been victims of bullying. Our vision is clear. We believe in total inclusion, about integration that goes beyond difference and labels. With science and robotic teams, Team Biospo Colombia at the core of our mission. These clubs are not only spaces where robots are built, but where friendships are built where invisible barriers are overcome and where diversity is our greatest strength. In these things, we are proud to bring together girls, girls, boys, and young people with Asperger syndrome, autism, and those from regular classroom or neurotypicals. They all are mixed like a mm, social blender. Uh, they learn and grow together. These spaces has been become a catalyst for the development of social skills, races, raising self-esteem and enlargement the frustration to resolve of each participant. And the most exciting thing is that we are not just building robots, we are building dreams. Each national and international robotics tournament is an opportunity for these young people to shine, to propose, to use their creativity, to fly with their imagination and to demonstrate their skills, to challenge expectations, and most importantly, to break the barriers of inclusion. At the head of our teams and our program is the Lego Education Robotics a powerful tool we use to build not only robots, but also creative and collaborative minds. By building Lego robots, participants not only learn the fundamentals of robotics, but also develop key skills, such as problem solving, critical thinking, and effective communication. This is technology in education, technology for inclusion, inclusive education through robotics. 
In addition to our robotization, we immerse ourselves in a world of workshop designs to nurture not only their technical skill, but also their social and emotional skills, which is at the core of our mission. With the specific workshops on inclusion, theater, body expression, stress management, and research techniques, sales techniques, and many, many more, we are building a comprehensive environment that goes beyond technology. Attending in world-renowned tournaments such as First Lego League is the epicenter of the commitment. These tournaments are not only science and robots competition, they are challenges that require our boys and girls to put into practice all the skills they have acquired. Working in teams, communicating efficiently, developing innovative and impactful research projects, creating and programming robots are just some of the skills that are put to the test. What makes this Lego League unique is its focus on social impact. It is not just about building robots, it's about demonstrating how kids and the skill acquired can impact society. It is a call to action, an opportunity to, for our kids to become agents of change. So, in summary, in our foundation and our teams, Biosbot Colombia, we are not only forging engineers and scientists, but also empathetic leaders. We are not only building machines, but an inclusive, innovative, and full of possibilities future. We build better human beings. For five long years of hard work, we have managed to impact more than 150 children and more than 300 families, where the impact is not only to parents and children, but to all those who make up the family and social group. In other words, we have impacted more than 4,000 people in Colombia. Today, I celebrate with all of you our victories in different science and robotics tournaments. These achievements are not only a recognition to effort, but a burning testimony of the authentic social inclusion that we are sowing in every corner in every space of our kids' life. The sparkle in this eyes is the spark of the revolution that goes beyond competition, is the flame of inclusion leading each one of us. We will continue to build this path of inclusion with passion. Every achievement we reach is more than a trophy, is the living proof that inclusion transforms life. What next? The future we envision is inclusive, full of achievement that reflect collective effort. We move forward with determination towards an horizon where every success is a milestone in the construction of a more egalitarian world full of opportunities. That is why our vision is to have our social inclusion program, not only in Colombia, but in many countries. This vision, this dream has begun to become a reality. Right now, we have reached Australia at the beginning of this year, and we hope that there will be many more countries. Therefore, I invite you to join us, to be part of the exciting robotic adventure, to help us grow, to become transforming agents. Together, we can build a path towards a future where social inclusion and innovation transform life all over the world. Join us and contribute to make this dream a global reality. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I think robotics, AI, when we talk about these technologies, we always think of the future. And I think what you're doing is going to be very useful to take uh, children with disabilities into the future. Yeah. Um, so we can't take for granted the benefits of the program that you are leading. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So we're going to move to our next presenter. Thank you all so far. We're keeping time. You're doing very well. So we're going to go to Yereli and Adriana from CPAD. Welcome. Thank you. Um, 
At Morada is a refuge for women who experience violence. This is what the app means to Irma. I use it with psychosocial disability. Good morning. Thank you, Zero Project, for the invitation. I am Adriana Garcia, Administrator of Interdisciplinary Center for Right, Childhood and Parentality, CIDIP. We will appreciate your patience as our English is not very fluent. We are an organization that was founded in 2017. We promote respect, guarantee, and exercise of the human rights of girls, teenagers, and women from an intersectional approach. We promote the participation and leadership in all process and action. We are the only organization in Mexico that has a gender, disability, and violence program. The Morada app is a technological tool for the prevention of an attention to violence against women with disabilities. It was born a response to the sexy violence experienced by women with disabilities since the lived experience of the members of CIGIP as daughters, sisters, cousin of women with disability, and as women who embody the ableism of this society. It is a free inclusive app the application is designed in accessible formats, has web accessibility and aimed especially for women with diverse disabilities. The Morada app has this name because in Spanish, the word refers to the purple color in the main symbol of the feminist struggle. And because it also means residence, the place where one lives. And the Morada app is a space where women with disabilities can feel protected and safe. Background Morada app. The, um, the Morada app is accessible to all disabilities. Was created in the midst of pandemic when rates of gender-based violence in Mexico were the highest. It was developed in response to the project of obstetric violence against women with disability conduct in 2019, in which 100% of the participants report having suffered violence at some point in their lives. In 2020, since there was no statistical data, organization carried out the first survey of violence against women with disabilities in Mexico was conducted to develop the application according to the needs of women with disabilities. Problems target. According to our surveys, 22 0.6% of women with disabilities in Mexico experience violence in which coincide with the official survey carried out a year after with ours. The women with disabilities in our country are invisible to laws, public policies, and government budgets. 98% do not denounce to the authority according to figures from the national survey carried out by organization. Solution and innovation. CIGIP needed to do something about violence against women with disability, which is why in the middle of the pandemic in 2020, Morada app was developed with the active participation of women with disabilities and evaluated by the women themselves in pilot groups. It was created to be fully accessible and comply with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 double A standard that will be actualized in 2024. It has screen write pictograms, easy readability, all content in these videos in Mexican sign language and offers target support for women with and without disabilities who are victims of gender bias and violence. It is inspiring so that no woman is left behind. That is why there has a video call available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mexican Sign Language providing women with emergency numbers of directing them to the right institution that offer help in case of violence. Now continue my partner, Jereli Rolander. Good morning, everyone. I would like to share with you some of function, function of the Morada app. It is an app with web accessibility, which includes information on the types and modalities of gender violence, information and directories of care institution to know what to do in case of violence, 
emergency calls, including video calling Mexican Sign Language, accessible tests on violence so that women know what type of violence they are experiencing and which institution they can turn to. The application is available in the Apple Store, Play Store for Android, and in the stock version. Impact. The Morada app has been consulted monthly by an average of 700 women. An app by itself will not have an impact on the elimination of violence against women if it is not accompanied by integral measures. This is why the Morada app carried out the following actions. We formed an alliance with the most important association of Mexican Sign Language interpreters and with feminist organization. We created an attention route with the Mexico City Women's Secretariat to provide timely attention to women with disability. In 2020, we trained 152 public servants to promote an inclusive culture of care for women with disability who experience gender-based violence. The Survey of Violence Against Women with Disability in Mexico City 2020 and the National Survey of Violence Against Women with Disability in Couple 2022 were carried out through the app. In 2023, the App Morada Movement training and promote the leadership of 32 women with disability throughout Mexico who promote the App Morada. Financing, the sustain sustainability and challenge. App Morada is financed with public funds and contribution from its members. The development of App Morada in 2020 was co-financed with its own funds and those of the Mexico City Women's Secretariat for the 2021 update, we had support of the Institute for People with Disability of Mexico City. By the end of 2023, we initiated a project with the United Nations Trust Fund to eliminate violence against women for its scalability and implementation in two more states of the Mexican Republic. The challenge are enormous. She need necessary to have more funding to achieve a national wide mapping and implement the application in each entity according to the system of violence. Project next steps. For 2024-2026, the response mechanism for the attention of violence against women with disability in Mexico will be implemented, which will improve, update, and expand the coverage of the Morada app in two more Mexican states, Nuevo León and Querétaro, in addition to training for public servants of the state system of violence, the implementation of a toolbox on gender, violence and disability, the creation of a standardized protocol for the attention of women with disability who are victims of violence, and the strengthening of the Sororidisca Network, a web who support women for women with disability. We will also generate a new strategies to reach women with disability who live a digital gender gap to leaving no one behind. No girl or, wo or woman should have to experience gender-based violence, facing it in a silence, alone, and without any support like the women with disability lives. Violence is not destiny. We want that any woman add to the statistic of feminicides at 10 women per day and 10 girls per month in Mexico. This have to finish. This have to change. And we need the technology can be our ally. It could be the difference to save a life or be a part of statistics. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I think there's something that you said that really resonated with me. Being invisible to support is something that no human being wants to experience. So I must congratulate you for what you're doing for the women of Mexico uh, and hopefully soon for the women of the world. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to Jeremy now, not forgetting you. Uh, please take it away. All right, good morning. Okay. Make sure this works. Is it this button? Yes. Oh, this one. Okay. 
Oh, okay. All right. Good morning. Uh, before I start, I would just like to thank Zero Project uh, and just express what an honor it is to be among such intelligent and innovative uh, in interventions. Uh, it truly is a source of pride and, and uh, certainly an honor to be here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Mashovli Skivri. It's an initiative that we started in the country of Georgia. Um, Mashovli Skivri somewhat uh, roughly translates in English into parents' chest. Uh, Skivri in Georgian is a container that Georgians will keep their souvenirs, their valuables, their tools. Essentially, it's part hope chest, part toolbox. And as we conceived the idea, we, we began to realize that's exactly what we wanted to create for parents across the country. But I get ahead of myself. This is, if we go back pre-pandemic, uh, this is what service from MAC looked like. And MAC, MAC exists to support persons with disabilities and their families by providing um, professional development and training, increasing access to information and resources, offering opportunity and hope but it had always been in person. Uh, we were very good at that. Oh, take it away. I skipped ahead, but that's okay. Oh, so anyway, so so um, so 2020 happened, the pandemic came and, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble with the slides. Okay, so 2020 came and as we all know, masks were put on, services were stopped, Families moved indoors and interpersonal communication essentially went virtual. Um, families during this time were struggling. They lost access to services they largely took, took for granted. Uh, and they were struggling with dealing with their children with educational issues, psychosocial issues, uh, a whole range of issues. The, the need was very high during that transition period. Likewise, we were at a loss. We were at a bit of a crisis because we wanted to support. We saw the need, um, but we didn't know how. We, you know, without that interaction, that person-to-person -person interaction, we we didn't know what we could do to help. It was out of this kind of situation, this moment, uh, that Michelle Skivri was conceived, and the the idea of Michelle Skivri and its at its heart is essentially is a Facebook page. Uh, if you look at Georgia, uh, Facebook is king. Many Georgians, they don't know how to do an email. They don't have email. Uh, for some of them, actually quite a few of them, they, they would be challenged to do a Google search. But for whatever reason, almost every single Georgian in the country is very adept and very active on Facebook. For us, it was an obvious choice. You know, let's use Facebook. It's a free, easy, accessible tool that we can get into the homes of just about every family across the country. And so we, we gathered our, our team, and, and we're very fortunate to have a team of occupational therapists, psychologists, speech and language therapists, project managers, and they, they all came together and we started to create different media, uh, different materials that would help parents in their current need. Uh, we did this through Facebook Lives, we did videos, we did um, you know blogs, um, and, and a whole variety of other things, infographs, uh, animations, anything we could do to try to get the, the information out in an easy to understand accessible way. Shortly after starting, we realized that we needed to go even further. And so we started a one-to-one -one consultation program where parents could really kind of dig into some of their specific questions by calling us up on Facebook, on uh, La, you know, using Zoom or a phone to really kind of ask their personal questions and get consultation from specialists who could give them more information or at least refer them to, to services that could. Uh, and so in that process, we, we continued to grow. We brought in a lot of different specialists. Uh, so we had legal specialists from around the country, medical specialists, anyone who could provide relevant and, and accurate information to these parents. And over time, it, you know, we, we grew and, and became a core resource for many parents and families across the country. Today, we have 40,000 followers, which in a country of 3.5 million is, is fairly significant. Now, thankfully, the, the pandemic ended, and with the end of the pandemic, behaviors, um, activities changed and perspectives, priorities, and so Michelle Skivri had to change with that. And so a few things that we've done in, you know, since the pandemic and to kind of continue to be relevant and actively you know, accessible, we, do, we now do in-person trainings uh, uh, where we bring experts together into, you know, into venues and we bring parents and families together where they can engage, network, ask questions and interact. 
We also do these mobile exhibitions where we gather specialists and service providers, both state and locally, uh, and then travel around to different communities around the country. The aim of this is to you know, bring parents together and share information about what services exist, uh, both private and through public entitlements. Again, one of the issues that we face consistently in Georgia is many, many families of persons with disabilities just don't know what's available to them. And so this is a simple way to bring them together and make them aware of that. It's also a good way to let them know about the platform and get them engaged if they're not already. So lessons learned from all of this. I would say the first lesson, it takes a lot of work, much more than I thought uh, to put together quality um, programming on a week by week basis that really is in touch with the, the population. Uh, you need to really be flexible, uh, informed and responsive. You know, we we had ideas about what the need were, but as we began to look more deeply and ask and kind of and begin to survey and do focus groups, we realized that we were missing out on some of the key points, and we had to change and be responsive to that. Social media is a very um, immediate tool, as we know, uh, and so we quickly learned that waiting a day or two to respond to someone who sent a message in was not going to be effective, and we actually had parents that felt isolated and kind of ignored because of that. You know, it, in an email, 24 hours is standard. It doesn't, you know, social media was a change in kind of uh, our, our approach. Um, and then experiment, be ready to make mistakes. They're going to happen, but learn quickly. Tips for success. Of course, internet is key. You have to have, you know, internet accessibility. Georgia was at this great window where it really almost had coverage across the country. And most families had access to at least a smartphone that, you know, that allowed this kind of medium to enter the homes and, to, and increase our reach and make it effective. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in kind of doing this sort of program, uh, that's really the fundamental first question you have to ask. Can you reach those that most need this kind of information? Gather feedback again. You're going to think you know a lot about what the needs are, but until you really look and, and ask, you, you're, you're not going to you know, fully cover what's, what's needed. It takes a village. I think this type of approach goes beyond any one organization. Uh, and I, we realized very early that we needed to bring in experts that were outside of our purview. And so reaching out to legal experts, medical experts, other psychologists, government officials, truly making this a, a resource that parents can come to, trust the information and really benefit from. Local context is important. Facebook worked for Georgia because that's what Georgians use, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right vehicle for or platform um, if you start at this in your own context. Be in tune to what people are using, what the needs are, and, and develop it around that. And do no harm. One of the reasons we started Skivery is because we saw lots of misinformation being spread around the country. Uh, you know, we, everything went digital, and so everyone had an equal platform. Uh, and we created this as a way to kind of consolidate and filter information that was accurate, trustworthy, um, and, and proven. Um, and so we really created it as a place that parents could come to and trust it and know that it was good for them, that it wouldn't you know, be harmful. In fact, we created a panel to and that we continue to use that screens the information to make sure that it's it is correct and accurate and beneficial. So summary, uh, I think that our experience has shown that social media can be an effective and cost effective way to get access into homes in countries where there's diff there's oftentimes lack of access. In Georgia, we have lots of families that live in the remote part of the country. They continue to be disconnected from services. They live far away from the service hubs, and they're still disconnected from getting access to services, support, information, and resources. By using this cost-effective means, we're able to get into their homes, give them information that supports their, their um, rearing and nurturing of their children, and makes hopefully makes their lives better and, and easier. So that concludes it. Again, I would like to thank everyone here for attending. And one last um, very important thanks to our team, Mac Georgia. Uh, I'm presenting, um, but really the real work comes from the people who are doing this day in and day out. And so thank you for your continual thank you. Uh, hard work. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Wow.
I mean, it's it's amazing to think that tools such as social media that are available to all of us, but how effectively have any of us used that to drive behavior change? I think what you're doing is incredibly important. And the fact that you realize that context, you know, is, is key. And so going to where people are, what they're using, and it's great to see that, you know, uh, speed of response and engagement uh, is something you prioritized when you were trying to choose which media you used. So thank you. All right, we're going to move on uh, pretty fast to Kwai. Um, living uh, dignified for, uh, uh, sorry, living dignity for the blind. Thank you. Please welcome for your presentation. Thank you, Bernard. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen in this conference room and those watching online. One greeting from Myanmar, Ming La Ba Xing. We deeply appreciate this opportunity to share our accomplishment and also present our needs. We would like to express our thankfulness to ESSL Foundation Zero Project team. Let me start by sharing with you the background and purpose that motivated our work. Our team, Living Dignity, was founded in 2019. At that time, massage is the only job for visually impaired persons in our country. Many youths, academic holders are sitting in hopeless after graduation. We could not benefit the assistive technology as well. Less than 10 blind persons were able to use a smartphone in terms of language barrier and of course uh, financial difficulty. Therefore, our team was organized to work on capacity building and technology improvement to explore job in alternative. So far, uh, we have taken the following steps or solutions to address our concern. Next slide, I think. Uh, we developed our language text to speech by collaborating with Sao Mai team in Vietnam. We developed our money reader app, fully access Myanmar keyboard for Android phone, an online platform computer training. And uh, we uh, provided online trainings, skill trainings during pandemic lockdown. We also conducted smartphone using trainings, computer trainings based on blind schools around the country. Yes. Moving forward, I would like to uh, highlight some success we have achieved through our collective efforts. By 2023, Thousands of blind persons are using smartphone and nearly 100 are using computer, acquiring uh, trainings and education. University students are also relieved as they could access trainings in public, although their schooling was paused uh, since uh, COVID pandemic. We have some to showcase uh, our key milestones. We success approaching teachers training college for enrollment. Mr. Soda Ang, uh, blind man, he is the first blind person half chance to attend teachers training college in our country. This is our initial step to provide quality education to blind students. By our approaching to this private college, they also accept two other candidates with physical impairment. Now their college become an uh, inclusive institution in this 2024. Some of our youths are self-employed by scaling up uh, with our project support. Uh, two blind men uh, on the top left photo, they explore job uh, in hotel. And the genius Ben in the other photo, uh, this Ben is the very first 
success blind music band in community. They are hired by restaurants, bars, and communities in, for festivals. They are very busy now, no time to work for massage. Uh, and another lady with guitar on the lower block photo, she, uh, she is a first success YouTuber among blind persons. And the other young man is a university student. He success approaching a professional training institution called Yangon Film School. It's for music and art. He is a first blind trainee and he completed sound design training. That is just a short training, but the training institution is now open for blind person. And the other uh, low vision lady teaching a blind child, she has got job uh, in private school for special needs children. Because of her, uh, two special needs blind children are accepted in that school. They are first schooling blind children with special needs. So we explore job and at the same time, we open up education for special needs blind children. There is no school yet uh, for them in our country. As our uh, work uh, impact, uh, visually impaired persons are well prepared to integrate in society when the business communication shift to online based uh, in our country after pandemic lockdown. By our integration, our community began to acknowledge the ability of visually impaired persons. Here, I would like to express our thankfulness to Nippon Foundation for funding and ICEVI on net uh, supporting us to make this happen. Now I would like to present the challenges we are encountering to carry on our good work. First, fundraising opportunity is closed at current situation, high political conflict in our country. And second, it is crucial needs for us to upgrade our uh, TTS. We could not imagine to, to be left behind uh, when our TTS stopped working. And we are also very much looking forward to include our TTS in iOS uh, smartphone. We really need uh, technical resources as well. If we could find ways to overcome these challenges, we are eager to work on the following steps. Of course, to upgrade our language TTS. Uh, then uh, to acquire advanced training on technology, to acquire resources, to open uh, education opportunity for special needs blind children. We really need to run job skill training center. Yes. We are now uh, in this stage, and then now I come to conclude my uh, presentation here. So I highly expect you all to join hands with us uh, to improve the living condition of uh, blind persons in our country. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presence here and your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kwai. I think uh, in a world where choice is a human right, it's, it's really sad that you can have a situation that the only option for you is one job, and your organization has changed that for Myanmar. So again, impressive. Uh, let's move on to Doren uh, from Teach Me Kazakhstan. Tell us your story. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really honored to be here to present, uh, to exchange and share and gain experience at uh, Zero Project, ZeroCon24. 
uh, we are really appreciating this. Uh, thank you for my colleagues. I uh, loved every one of your presentation. So yes, uh, my name is Dorian. I'm from Kazakhstan, uh, working at Public Fund I Teach Me. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so have you ever been in uh, Central Asia countries, such as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, or Turkmenistan? Uh, if someone was here, please raise hand. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, in yeah, in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia countries, uh, unfortunately, we do not often see people with disabilities outside uh, in the society. Uh, even so, in Kazakhstan, there are more than 700,000 people with disabilities. It is ap approximately seven or eight percent of population of Kazakhstan. We don't see people with disabilities outside. Uh, there are several reasons, reasons for this. The, the first one, it is that uh, we have undeveloped infrastructure, uh, infrastructure such as public transportation, uh, buildings, uh, schools, universities, and etc. Uh, a lot of buildings in Kazakhstan are not accessible for people with disabilities. Second reason is we still have stereotype in the society that disability associated with uh, illness, weaknesses, and etc. Uh, because of these two reasons, uh, people with disabilities uh, have feeling like fear or self-doubt and they don't want to go in the society because it's not friendly. And uh, another reason is that our educational, uh, vocational education are not accessible uh, in most of the uh, educational buildings in Kazakhstan. So, uh, Public Fund Tachishmi knows about every these problems and that's why our foundation was created. Uh, our mission is, our goal is to promote the development of an inclusive society and inclusion of persons with disabilities in full social life. Uh, this is our team uh, who is working in Kazakhstan, who is working uh, at our uh, public fund. So here we can... Uh, our goal of the project is to promote the development of an inclusive society and the inclusion of persons with disabilities in full social life. And uh, this is our keynote. Here we can see results of our project. Uh, right now we have more than 900 graduates. 80% uh, of them are people with disabilities and 90% of our graduates are already employed. Uh, we started in 2019. Uh, at this time, there was only uh, 16 graduates. And there were third, uh, three partners, but right now uh, we implemented uh, successfully implemented seven intakes of our project. And right now we have more than 6,000 applications to be in our project, to uh, get experience and uh, skills in our project. And uh, we are really proud about our results and. Uh, we will we will be glad to share uh, experience. So uh, by this time, we implemented more than thirty five projects uh, in whole Kazakhstan. In and with this experience, we uh, created our methodology methodology how to uh, do a great job. I mean, uh, how to create a good project. So the main ingredients are. First one, uh, we created our soft skills program, uh, uh, which is offline educational block where we overcome complexes and fears, where we learn to declare ourselves and our talents to the world, world where we learn to communicate and answer uncomfortable questions. Uh, our participants at this block, uh, they are finding friends, they are setting goals, and they uh, learn how to reach your goals. And uh, what is important, uh, they can uh, socialize. The second uh, block is our online educational block, hard skills. We uh, created a several, like more than 15 online courses uh, on Russian language, Kazakh language, and sign language. And these uh, courses are in digital spheres, such as UX UI design, social media marketing, graphic design, uh, motion design, uh, mobilography, uh, Q&A engineer and etc. So the people with disabilities can work outside, uh, can work online and can have a freelance job. 
And the third ingredient is uh, assistance in employment. We're helping to communicate with uh, employers and uh, our participants, beneficiaries with each other. We're helping to uh, create a good uh, CV, uh, how to create your portfolio, especially in the design sphere. And uh, by all of these uh, ingredients, uh, we think that uh, you can create a good project. <laughs> so, uh, in after 16 takes, we introduced the gamification. Uh, yes, it was there in some kind of the degree, but now we made in our main focus and implemented at all of our stage of the project. It has game point system, interesting extra tasks, special prizes and boost of their appearance on social media. Uh, here we can see some of the elements of our guidebook with the main page statistics where people can find their game points uh, to find uh, which participants are in which city, and etc. Uh, here it is a, a hard skills block where uh, participants can choose the, their major, uh, which kind of course they want to learn, uh, communicate with teacher, uh, have a video lessons, extra materials, and uh, in gaming in gamification formats uh, they can learn uh, how to uh, how to gain this profession. Uh, before gamification, we had like almost 50% of conversion uh, who are successfully uh, graduating in our projects. But after implementing gamification processes, we increased our uh, conversion up to 80%. Uh, here's some of our awards. Okay. And uh, plans for the future. So uh, we believe that this uh, our methodology methodology can work and uh, can be uh, useful for uh, people with disabilities, and we are ready to share our experience and also gain experience from uh, colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> so. Okay, uh, we must. Imp uh, we must improve our project so that it can help even more audience with greater effectiveness. And even the gamification at its full scale is un uh, underdeveloped and we can make it more digital, more game simplified. Also, we would like to make I Teach Me more international. We are looking for partners who, uh, wanna, uh, who want to uh, change experience. So, uh, in conclusion, by giving my speech at the stage of ZeroCon24, I want to say thanks for the everyone here. And don't forget that uh, with the collaboration of the minds, we can make the world a better place for others. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duran. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how diverse we've seen uh, the use of technology and media to address the needs of those with disabilities. And, and I think for me this session, my biggest takeaway is that solutions exist and platforms like ZeroCon, uh, you know, have helped us to see that we have solutions. And the call to action is how can we amplify these solutions? How can we learn and make sure that they can be scaled? Um, it does look like we do have a little bit of time. Um, I'm looking at my, <laughs> we have three minutes. So what I'm going to do with this uh, three minutes, um, I'm not going to open up Q&A, but I want uh, to give each of our participants, uh, of our panelists, um, an opportunity for a parting shot. And this parting shot uh, should not be long, just a statement on uh, what is your call to action uh, that you would want to see from ZeroCon and how um, after leaving this room, uh, where can people find you to, to talk to you? Uh, and we're going to start uh, on my left with Kwai. Um, welcome, parting shot. And where can people find you or talk to you during this conference? Yes, Kwai. Um, you just like your last message to the group. And how can are you do you have a booth somewhere or where can people find you in the conference? 
Yes. Yeah, I, I, I would like to say just thank you so much. And uh, I'm really, I feel like very privileged to be here. I'm very honored. I learned a lot from uh, the presentations yesterday, uh, others, and uh, from the boot, I found some very helpful tool for, uh, for blind children to learn Braille. Yeah, that's okay. thank you. Thank you so much, Je Jeremy. Sure. I think, and just to summarize quickly, I think ZeroCon gives an opportunity to inspire and to really kind of stimulate ideas to think outside the box. And so okay. I think really taking advantage of that. And if you want to find me, I'm floating around. So, all right, Deborah. For me. I can see we had just have one moment. Yeah. And I think for me, I, it is really an honor to be here. And I really, I'll be available here for any um, engagement. But I think we have a lot of room of collaboration and really see how we can learn yeah. from one another. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Duran, it's next to me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone. So, uh, if you want to, if you want to find us, you can Google "I Teach Me" on, on Instagram or on Google and uh, just text us. Uh, we believe that online educational materials uh, combined with soft skills, digital skills, are uh, really a good accessible way to uh, create an inclusive society. All right, Pedro. Thank you. It's short. You can find uh, in social media uh, just a uh, team bios bot. Um, thank you, Sirio Con, for this opportunity. It's a great, great honor to be here and uh, really honored to be here. Thank you. And lastly, Cherely and Adriana. Thank you, you for the invitation. It is a space to make visible the intersectionality between gender and disability and to generate alliance. Uh, you can find us in Facebook like CIDIP Derechos. Thank, Thank you. you. And ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to close this session and to uh, leave the challenge to you, reach out to them and let's work together to amplify, uh, you know, the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Bye bye.